and good evening and good morning to everybody who has joined us either from US, either from India who are in evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, with us today one of the noted scientists, uh, Dr. Imran Khan, who is working as a senior scientist at one of the leading pharmaceutical industry in the United States, uh, Bristol Mayor Skeb at St. Diego. Uh, Dr. Imran Khan will be with us for around one and a half hour, and this session will be moderated by Dr. Said Mubarak Hussain. In this session, we particularly want to talk about uh, different opportunities uh, related to carriers and biotechnology. Uh, this will be, I, I, I'm sure that this will be a very interesting session, particularly for our mentees and to all uh, who, are, who are at JK Scientists and are interested in uh, understanding different opportunities in uh, biotechnology beyond academia. Uh, Dr. Said Mubarak Hussain will be uh, moderating this session. Uh, Dr. Said is president of JK Scientists and he is uh, assistant professor at New, uh, University of New Mexico, uh, specializing in uh, development of neurobiology. Dr. Said Mubarak Hussain, may I kindly request you to introduce uh, Dr. Imran to the audience, please. Thank you, Shukriya. Uh, Salam alaikum, good evening, uh, Sat Namaskar, Adab. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Imran Khan. I had a pleasure to meet him recently when I was uh, visiting San Diego. He's a, a scientist at uh, Bristol uh, Meyer Scripps, uh, one of the leading biotech companies. Before joining Bristol Myers, he was a staff scientist and postdoc at Hollings Cancer Center. He's the only uh, NCI designated cancer center in uh, America, in South Carolina. I don't know, maybe there are more. I'm a basic biologist. Yeah, there I don't are know more. much about. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. So he has worked on the characterization of monobodies. And uh, over the years, he has worked uh, mostly around the same topic how do we design therapies or therapeutic, uh, therapeutics for cancer uh, or for uh, controlling cancer? And uh, I would go a little bit back uh, for, uh, in his journey. He started his journey from uh, Magnipura, a, a village in Bandipura, Kashmir. He did his uh, PhD at Ames in Delhi. And uh, then he uh, migrated to America and then he stayed here. Uh, I think we all have that desire to give back to the community, back to the society, and I appreciate your time, uh, Dr. Imran Khan Saab. And uh, from our experiences, what we have learned, uh, I can talk to them about mostly about flies and, and basic biology. I have no knowledge about biotechnology, although I, 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 I think I, I was not being exposed to biotechnology, biotechnology research. So I didn't uh, at least even try to, to go to that sector. And you are an expert and it's our pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thanks very much for your time. No problem, and, thanks. And I think thanks. we will start with your research, what you have done, uh, what you want to share us, your excitement of research. You have published many amazing papers and he has also patents, which uh, is remarkable. And many of the industries uh, which are leading Galaxy Client Smith are using uh, his uh, research findings in their own products. Thank you very much. I, it's up to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mubarak, for the introduction and going through my background. Uh, I would like to thank you and your team for the amazing job that you are doing uh, for the society, for the community. Um, so in today's seminars, First, I'll be talking about some aspects of my research domain. Obviously, it's not possible to dissect in or discuss all aspects given the time constraints. So I'll be providing mere snapshots of some of the stories that were out recently. Then I'll be happy to take any questions that are exclusively related to the science part of the talk. Then I hope to give my perspective about academia and the industrial settings. Followed that, I'll be happy to take questions related to career options, both from the panel as well as the audience. So let me try to share my screen. It says host disabled screen sharing. Uh, 
Harry, I'm not please uh, allow him to share the screen. Yeah, just I will let him. Uh, uh, have just a second. Make a host. Yeah, can you try now, Imran sir? Yeah. Yeah. Can you guys see my screen? No, no sir. not yet. Yeah, yeah, it's, now, it's, yeah. it's, it's up. Oh, okay. yes. So before I joined Bristol Myers Squibb, I was a senior scientist slash postdoc at uh, Hollings Cancer Center uh, at Medical University of South Carolina, where our lab primarily focused on oncogene RAS. Uh, as most of uh, you might be aware that RAS is one of the challenging molecules to target, and four decades of intense research has led to the finding of only one clinically viable RAS inhibitor making a lot of people in the RAS biology to think that RAS is kind of undruggable. However, our lab took an innovative approach that highlighted some novel vulnerabilities in the RAS biochemistry that can be used for targeting. So based on that, I have titled today's talk as challenging the conventional wisdom of dragging the undruggable RAS. Before we dive into the main data, I would like to give a brief overview about RAS, what its role is in human tumors, and why targeting RAS historically has been challenging, and then jump into the approach that we employed and why it has advantages. So RAS is one of the most commonly used oncogenes. In, is my screen moving? I don't see it moving. Are you? Yes, now it's moving, yeah, I can see. It's the next slide now. Yeah. Okay, RAS is one of the most frequently mutated oncogenes in human tumors, and about one third of all human tumors contain mutations in one of three RAS isoforms, K, N, and H RAS. And in some cancers like pancreatic cancer, this RAS mutational load is more than 95%. RAS is required both for the initiation, maintenance, and the progression of human tumors. If we take the example of pancreatic cancer, the onset of KRAS mutation converts the normal pancreatic epithelia into pain in lesions, which then with proto-cooperation of some other oncogenes or loss of tumor suppressor functions are converted into more aggressive pain in lesions, leading to the establishment of PDAC or pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma that then eventually leads to invasion and metastasis. So paramount is the role of RAS in human tumors that RAS has been titled as the heartbeat of cancer. Now, if we look at RAS biochemically, it is a small molecular GTPs that shuttles between the inactive GDP loaded state to the active GTP loaded state. The inactive form is converted to the active form by the action of nucleotide exchange factors or GAPs, and the active form is reverted back to its inactive state by RAS's intrinsic hydrolysis that's catalyzed by GTPase accelerating proteins or GAPs. However, during oncogenesis, there occur mutations, preferably at codons 12, 13, and 61, that keep the RAS locked in the active GTP bound state. This increases its binding to downstream effectors like RA, thus increasing the RAS signaling cascade like the RA MAPK signaling cascade and leading to the onset of oncogenic insults. Historically, targeting RAS has been challenging, primarily what was believed to be lack of suitable drug binding pockets and the picomolar affinity of RAS for the activating nucleotides that are present in cells in millimolar amounts. However, the important breakthrough in the direct RAS inhibition came from the lab of Kevin Shaukat and his colleagues who discovered certain compounds. I don't think it's moving again. It... Yeah, no, I don't know some, maybe it's lagging. However, the important breakthrough in the direct RAS inhibition came from the lab of Kevin Shaukat and colleagues who discovered certain compounds that directly bound to KRAS G12C mutants. Intriguingly, these compounds 
bound to RAS in the inactive GDP loaded state. Following this exciting discovery, various groups and pharmaceutical companies tried to exploit this pocket of opportunity. And indeed, two compounds, one was Amgen compound 510 or Sotaricep, which now clinically is called Luma Keras, and Mirati's compound Adgarasib were approved for treatment of smoking lung cancers. Now, as exciting as this was in the RAS field, having a direct RAS inhibitor, now if we genotype this KRA G2LC mutation spectrum across various tumor types, they are predominantly present in lung cancers, but are very rare in more aggressive RAS addicted tumors like the pancreatic cancer and the colorectal cancer. And overall, G2LC represents mere 2% of all KRAS mutations. Thus, there is still an unmet need to target non KRAS G2LC mutant tumors. To address this, previously our lab used an innovative approach using monobodies as RAS targeting biologics. Now, what are monobodies? Monobodies are high affinity protein reagents that often bind the functional site of their target and usually inhibit their function. This FN3 domain has the same like the CDRs of antibodies. The art of monobodies was pointed and refined by our collaborator, Shoi Koidi, who is now at NYU. I think there is a lag when I'm trying to move forward. Yes. So now there are some definite superiorities of monobodies over the conventional antibodies. One being, there are only about 90 amino acids, which makes them roughly one-tenth of the size of an antibody, which is a good thing because they are smaller, therapeutically viable that way. Further, these monobodies don't have any cysteine residues, so they don't have any disulfide bond. So what would that mean when we put them in the cells? Cytosol environment is reducing, so they are not susceptible to that redox cellular environment. So uh, clinically viable that way too. And you could basically genetically encode them. Further, these monobodies like antibodies can detect subtle changes in proteins, be it a change in protein conformation or a post-translational modification. Now the question was, can we generate monobodies that inhibit RAS? The answer is RAS. Previously, our lab discovered a monobody that binds with low nanomolar affinity to H and K RAS. Remarkably, this monobody did not bind to NRAS. Now, a lot of biochemical and biophysical characterization reveal that NS1 binds to what's called the self-association region of RAS. And this region is very similar in H and K RAS and differs by one amino acid at position 135 in N RAS. So a mere change of one amino acid makes NS1 refractory to bind to N RAS, showing the versatility of these monobodies. Now the model that was proposed for NS1's mechanism of action was that RAS, when GTP loaded, means that when it's active, it self associates and forms RAS dimers or higher order clusters. And that RAS dimerization in turn is a prerequisite for BRAF, CRAF heterodimerization. What NS1 does, it abrogates this RAS self association that in turn inhibits the BRAF, CRAF heterodimerization and consequently inhibits RAS signaling. Now, all this data <clears throat> to understand NS1's mechanism of action were done in model cellular system. We next wanted to ask the question, can NS1 inhibit RAS in the oncogenic context, meaning in the cells which endogenously harbor these RAS mutations? So for this, we engineered various human tumor lines to express NS1 monobody on DOX induction. So here I'm just, as I told, I'll be giving the snapshots. Uh, so I'm uh, taking a representative cell line. Uh, so if we look at a KRA G12V mutant pancreatic cells. <clears throat> the DOX induction leads to the robust expression of NS1 and that drastically <clears throat> decreases the RAS map case signaling as measured by ACT2 ERK. And when we assay their proliferation in 2D uh, tissue culture conditions, we could see that the expression of NS1 decreases the proliferation rate of these cells. <laughs> to evaluate other hallmarks of cancer as anchorage independent growth is one of the characteristics of these cancer cells. So we did the 3D soft agar assays and we could see 
that the excess of NS1 decreases the soft agar colony formation. To see if NS1 retains isoform selectivity, we took the lung cancer line having NRAS mutation. Though we could see the expression of NS1, but this expression of NS1 did not decrease the MAP case syndrome. It did not change the proliferation rate. Further, it had no effects on the anchorage independent growth, highlighting that NS1 retains isoform selectivity even in the oncogenic context. Now to further dig deep, we did uh, does tumor assays using athymic neuron mice xenograft models. So for this, we divided mice into three cohorts. No docs would mean they were they never saw the docs, so they would not express monobody. And in one cohort, we added put them on the docs two days after cell inoculation. And others will let the tumors to form. And once they reach a particular level, dimensions less than 100 millimeter cube, which roughly corresponded to day nine, we put them on the docs. So when we did the tumor growth profile, we could see that there was decrease in the tumor growth kinetics in both these docs treated cohorts. Now, analyzing these tumors biochemically, we saw that monobody expression only in the docs treated cohorts. And this expression of monobody robustly decreased the RAS mediated map case signal. Now, in an NRAS mutant line, I think it's not, sometimes it lags behind, does not let me into the slide. Can you let this somebody to enter in admin? Yeah. And Ransa, what's the problem? Okay. It's not I allowing think some me Some people are joining forward. late, maybe that's the problem, right? It's not allowing me to move forward with the slides, like right now. So probably sometimes it use, goes. Probably you have to use the interface itself rather than using the keys on the uh, keyboard. Yeah, I, I'm trying that also. Yeah, yeah, maybe some thing lagging. Yeah, right now it has got stuck. It's not allowing me to go forward. Yeah. Yeah, now it's here. I don't know. It lags very drastically. I think it lags. Maybe. Yeah. So now, if we take the example of NRAS mutant line, we did not see any inhibition on the tumor progression. And when we analyzed the, these tumors biochemically, though we saw the monobody expression, but it did not uh, inhibit the RAS mediated MAP case signaling, again, highlighting uh, the isoform selectivity of NS1. Now we next wanted to ask the question, uh, can, what does NS1 do to the immune phenotype? Like uh, just for your background, pancreatic cancers are Immuno, immunologically cold means that they have low infiltration of the immune cells. So our question basically was, if we inhibit the RAS intrinsically in the cells, does it tinker the immune phenotype uh, of the pancreatic cancer? So we had to use the immune competent mice and to assay that before you had to use the syngenic cells. So we used one of the most widely used pancreatic cancer line, mouse line, KPC, Again, we engineered them to express NS1 on DOCS induction. We saw that it decreased the MAPK signaling. And again, it decreased the growth kinetics as measured by proliferation in 2D and also inhibited uh, the anchorage independent as seen by 3D soft agar assays. Now, when we, what we did is we injected these KPC cells, which also were engineered to express luciferase directly into the pancreas of immune competent C57 black mice. So you can see here again, as in uh, xenografts, we divided mice into three cohorts. We could see that there was drastic decrease in the tumor progression in both uh, these dox treated cohorts. Now we went after our real aim, uh, how does it change the immune phenotype? So for this, what we did, we did the multiplex immune phenotyping to assay these tumors from all the cohorts for uh, CD4 and CD8 cells. So what we found is that um, there was increase in the L penetration of CD4 cells in both docs treated cohorts. Surprisingly, we did not see any increase in the infiltration of CD8 cells. Like classically, CD8 cells are considered as major forces in adaptive immunity. However, 
lot of subclinical and clinical data recently have demonstrated that CD4 cells by themselves can be anti-tumorogenic. So what we saw that when we in, inhibit KRAS in the cells, it increases the infiltration of CD4 cells or a subset of T cells, which could be very vital going forward that when you have to design or change the immune milieu, you better concentrate on what arm of T cells we want to engage there. Uh, because if in such cases, if we engage CD8, um, there would be basically, uh, it would not be that fruitful given that CD8 infiltration is not significant. So you would have to bet and design an arm which engages the CD4 cells. <clears throat> now, building on our success with NS1, we wanted to hunt for more RAS targeting monobodies. <clears throat> so, but what was our <clears throat> rationale for uh, screening and another monobody targeting RAS? <clears throat> if you remember in the beginning, I told you that RAS shuttles between these two nucleotide loaded states, and in between this APO or the nucleotide free is considered mere transitory given it has picomolar affinity for the RAS. So people thought it's not viable in the cells. <clears> However, <throat> our lab had previously made an exciting discovery of the possible existence of RAS in the APO state by showing it binds to PI3C2 beta in vitro. So we wanted to chase this if uh, it is a possibility in the cells. The simple experiment would have been to express recombinant PI3C2 beta and use that as a high affinity reagent to pull down RAS and then assay the RAS nucleotide loaded states uh, with that PI3C2 beta pull down. However, the lab had problems expressing recombinant PI3C2 beta. So what we thought is, is there the way we could still chase this question? So we asked Shoei's group to generate monobodies, which are apo selective means they only bind to nucleotide free state. And indeed, they were able to hunt two monobodies called R15 and R18, which only bound to RAS in the APO state or the nucleotide free state, but did not bound to any of the nucleotide loaded states, either GDP or GTP. Surprisingly, when we put these monobodies in the cells, what we saw is that they did not bind to RAS wild type, like bound feebly to RAS wild type, which you would anticipate as it's in the GDP loaded state. They did not bind drastically to G2LV. Again, that's anticipated because G2LV being oncogenic mutant is mostly GTP locked. They bound to 16N and 119N. These are the mutants which are kind of surrogates of nucleotide free as they have 1000 to 10,000 fold or less affinity for nucleotides. So again, that was anticipated. But surprisingly, these monobodies bound to mutants like 13D and 61L, which um, if you predict these being oncogenic mutants should be GTP locked. So why a monobody that is aposelect to in vitro in cells is binding to an oncogenic GTP lock mutant? So we repeated this experiment a lot of times, different hands and consistently found that this R15 has bias towards selected oncogenic RAS mutants. While we were trying to figure out the method for this madness of R15, around the same time, there was a paper from Mitsu Ikro's group at University of Toronto. So what they did is they characterized various RAS mutants in terms of the intrinsic exchange. And surprisingly, they found that mutants like 2LV are kind of chronically GTP locked. Once they bind GTP, they stay hung to it. They don't release it. And mutants like 13D and 61L, once they bind nucleotide, they spontaneously release it. But Clinically, they are oncogenic because if they release it fast, they bind it fast. Now, when we extrapolate it back to R15, does this mean if they release the nucleotide fast, like 13D and 61L, would that mean that the propensity of these mutants attaining the APO state is higher? And when they provide more window, a window of opportunity for R15 to capture them and kind of enlarge them and build them in the APO state. Now, to extrapolate this, we did a chain of uh, RAS mutants. Here I'm showing uh, only some, but in the paper you can see we, we dug about 24 different RAS mutants. And we found that the binding of R15 kind of, we categorized into three groups. One was high exchange mutants were trapped 
more drastically than the intermediate exchange mutants, and it did not bound to slow exchange mutants like 2LC, 2LV, and the wild type. So this is good, but this indirectly tells us perhaps R15 captures these mutants in the apostate. But what is the proof that indeed the RAS that binds to R15 is nucleotide free? So for this, what we did, we did devised a simple biochemical experiment. We put the RAS mutant along with the monobody, either NS1, NS1 is agnostic to nucleotide state. It binds to H and K RAS, irrespective of either they are GDP or GTP. And R15 binds selected mutants, but only in the APO state. So now if we express these RAS mutants either with NS1 and R15 and pull down the RAS with the monobody, now we release the RAS from the monobody and check its binding to RAF RBD. It's to be mentioned that RAS binds to RAF RBD when it's only GTP loaded. So what we found is that when we release the RAS, so this is a RAS released from NS1 input RAS, and this is a RAS list from R15. When we check the RAS list from NS1, as predicted, it did bind to RAF RBD. When we added GTP gamma to it, we see that there was no change in the binding. Possibly the RAS brought down with NS1 is saturated with GTP. Now the RAS release from R15 did not bind to RAF RBD, highlighting that indeed it's in the APO state. That's why it does not bind to RAF RBD. To prove it further, we added GTP gamma back to the R15 eluted RAS, and we could see that we regained the binding. Again, highlighting that this was EPO in the beginning, and when we add GTP gamma, we regain that binding. We showed this for a panel of RAS mutants. Here, I'm just showing another mutant 13D. We see that R15 eluted RAS is in the EPO state, and we can regain that binding. So here, we found a novel vulnerability in a RAS and that we can trap RAS from selected mutants in the APO state in the cells. Thus, in contrast to the conventional wisdom where people, the dogma was nucleotide free RAS don't exist in the cells and cannot be targeted. So we found there is a possibility of trapping RAS in the APO state and perhaps inhibiting it. So right until now, we have shown that RAS has a propensity to exist in the APO state, but, and it binds to it, but does this binding collab corroborate to RAS inhibition. So for this, what we did, we grew, did the growth factor stimulation of the cells. And as you can see here, the growth factor stimulation activates the RAS as measured by actor. NS1 as predicted inhibited it, and so did the R15. So we kind of saw that this binding corroborates to RAS inhibition. So we then went on to check it with a panel of RAS mutants. This is the control by why we just had the monobody and not the RAS, we could see that they don't activate ERK. So it's a good news because kind of meaning that monobodies are not tumorogens, they don't cause tumors. That's what we want. Now, when we took a HRAS mutant, which is a slow exchange mutant, means chronically GTP locked, NS1, because this being HRAS inhibits it, but R15 did not inhibit it because it does not bind to with great amount to this mutant. Now, when we look at Fast exchange mutant, HRAS 61L, both NS1 and R15 inhibited. Similarly, another KRAS fast exchange mutant was inhibited both by NS1 and R15. Now, when we took an NRAS mutant, so this being NRAS, NS1 did not inhibit it, whereas R15 inhibited. If you see there is, it drastically inhibits the fast exchange mutant and moderately inhibits uh, intermediate exchange mutants. Now to see if these monobodies are RAS selective, we use the downstream oncogenic kinases like MAC and RAF, and like NS1, R15 did not inhibit the MAP case signaling mediated by molecules other than RAS, highlighting that they are RAS selective. Now, next we wanted to ask this question, does the signaling inhibition corroborate to biological transformation? So for this, what we did, we took NIH3T3 cells, and put the RAS, different RAS mutants and the monobodies in them. So these are G12V, which are slow exchange mutants. These being H and K RAS were inhibited by NS1, but R15 did not inhibit it as they are chronically GTP locked and exchange nucleotides very slowly. However, when we took the fast exchange mutant 61L, 
like NS1, R15 also inhibit the foci formation in these cells. And when we took the NRAS fast executant, NS1 did not because this being NRAS, whereas R15 did because it's a fast executant. So now to further elaborate that they are RAS selective when we use these monobodies in presence of other non-RAS uh, oncogenes, we saw that they did not inhibit the foci formation. Again, highlighting that these monobodies are RAS selective. Now we next wanted to ask the question, does R15 have the same potency to inhibit RAS in the real oncogenic lines which have come from the patients? So uh, again, we saw that there is R15 expression on DOX induction. It decreases MAPK signaling proliferation as well as the soft agar call. This is a fast exchange mutant. Again, a colorectal line. Again, a fast exchange mutant. We see inhibition and in signaling proliferation as well as the anchorage ribbon group. Now, intermediate exchange pancreatic line harboring G12R mutation, which is the second, third predominant mutation in the pancreatic cancer. We see inhibition and in signaling, proliferation, as well as the anchorage interdependent growth. Uh, G12D, which is the most common oncogenic mutant in the pancreatic cancer, we see decrease in signaling, proliferation, as well as the 3D soft agarases. Now, when we took a G12V mutant, slow exchange mutant, we could see there was subtle inhibition in signaling, no significant decrease in the proliferation, and no difference in the 3D soft agarases, highlighting the mutant selectivity of R15. I, I guess we evaluated the RAS selectivity as well as the potency of R15 in about 21 different cell lines. Here, this is just the snapshot. Next, we wanted to ask the question, what does it do to the tumor progression? Uh, if we take the G2LD mutant, we see that there is decrease in the tumor progression. Again, when we analyze these tumors biochemically, monobody, only in the dox treated cohorts, it decreases MAPK signaling as well as the AKT signaling. Now, when we analyze these tumors histologically, H and E staining kind of revealed that there might be the apoptotic phenotype in these dox treated cohorts. So we, we went on to check that. So we did the multiplex uh, staining, uh, staining these tumors simultaneously for monobody, which in this case is shown by green, GFP, KI67, magenta, and cleaved caspis yellow. When we analyzed the tumors overall, we found that there was monobody production only in the dox treated cohorts, and that decreased the proliferation as seen by decreased K67 and induced apoptosis as seen by cleaved caspis in the dox treated cohorts. Now, in a G2LV uh, xenographs, we saw that there was not drastic reduction in the tumor progression. And when we analyzed these tumors biochemically, though there was monobody production, but it did not inhibit the MAPK signaling or the AKT signaling. Again, histological uh, phenotype did not reveal any drastic changes between monobody expressing and non-monobody expressing cohorts. And when we analyze these tumors, uh, histologically uh, staining them simultaneously for all three markers, we found that though there was monobody production in the dox treated cohorts, but it did not uh, reduce KI67 or induced apoptosis as seen by cleaved caspis, highlighting that even in the oncogenic models, this R15 retains mutant selectivity. Now, going more to the clinically relevant models, we got our hands on the patient-derived xenografts from the colorectal cancer. So we got those xenografts, we uh, engineered them to express R15, again on the DOX induction. And when we put them back in the mice, we saw that there was decrease in these PDX models on DOX induction, that would mean R15 expression. And when we analyzed these tumors biochemically, we saw the monobody expression only in the dox treated cohorts that decreases the RAS signaling as measured by active ERK. And when we analyzed these tumors histologically, we again saw that there was decrease in the proliferation as assayed by KI67 and induced apoptosis as seen by the cleaved caspis. Now to summarize it all, what we for the first time demonstrated that there is a possibility of targeting RAS in the apostate, both in vitro as well as in cells and the mice models. Further, we saw that R15 inhibits a selected set of RAS oncogenic mutants, mainly fast and intermediate exchange mutants. 
It blocked their biological transformation, as we saw by post formation in NH3T3 cells. It inhibits their proliferation, encourage independent growth, and other hallmarks of the cancer. And we showed its efficacy even in clinically relevant PDX models. And we show that R15 traps RAS in the APO state. And once it builds in the APO state, it decreases the association of RAS with RAF. And hence, in contrast to the current dogma, there is a new opportunity of targeting and catching RAS when it's nude. That would mean when it's APO or nucleotide free. The, this was another story which recently came around a few months back in the PNS where we characterized a different monobody, uh, which binds to the switch one uh, second region because of time constraints, I'm not going through the data. Now, why does our research stand in uh, RAS field? So the NS1 monobody that I gave the snapshots in the beginning has become one of the most widely used tool in the whole RAS community globally. And I'm just highlighting a couple of papers. So there was a paper from GSK in UK who used our monobody NS1 and made a protect version of it and showed its efficacy. And a Merck at Singapore and Cambridge, what they did is they used our mRNA, uh, NS1 and delivered it as mRNA because it was around the COVID time as when mRNA delivery kind of came in vogue. So they used this NS1 and delivered it as mRNA and showed its efficacy in a wide range of tumors. Uh, now at the end, uh, of course, this work would not have been possible without the support uh, from my mentor, John P. O'Brien uh, and others in the lab. Mariam, who instantly happens to be my wife, was part uh, of these studies and our, our collaborator, Shoi Koidi and Akiko Koidi at NYU and of course the funding agencies. Thank you for your time and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. It seems a wonderful collaboration, a very productive collaboration. Yeah, thank uh, you. Thanks uh, for highlighting your research and research products. Uh, if anybody in the audience has any question, please uh, either raise your hand or unmute yourself uh, before uh, Zahida Kamri has raised her hand. Zahida, you can ask your question. Imran, so we can stop yes. sharing, then you can see better. Maybe yeah, that, that's what I'm trying to do. It's not allowing me to stop. Oh, yeah. Is it's it, it stopped now? Well. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. It, it takes a, yeah, it takes a sec. It takes, it, there's a lag, I think, uh, in between yeah. some. Yeah, thank you That's so much. That's what Mubaksa was that. saying. There is yeah. always a lag between live lag. and non live. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So uh, thank you so much uh, for um, sharing your um, uh, research with us. And uh, we uh, like, um, especially me, I am uh, from an oncologist, um, uh, like oncology lab, and I have done all these assays and I know what um, time and effort goes into these, all these experiments. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I was going to like, I have done mostly my work on um, uh, lung cancer and breast cancer. So I'm seeing that uh, there is a lot of accelerated FDA approved um, uh, inhibitors um, uh, for lung cancer, but at the same time, I'm seeing a lot of uh, like rejections for pancreatic cancer for all those uh, drugs like uh, what was Sotora, Sotora, Sotara, 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 yeah, yeah. So. Um, I, I was going into details and uh, I thought that uh, like the mutation is different in these two cancers. And uh, so I just want, I'm like curious um, at what stage of um, clinical research, like you have done all the preclinical research uh, till now. So do you see um, uh, in future uh, that uh, it will be uh, FDA approved or uh, have you started some uh, uh, trials uh, on this NS1 in pancreatic so, like, cancer? Yeah, th this is actually a very good question. So sotaracib, uh, if uh, 
which is a G12C mutation. So G12C mutation is predominantly present in lung cancers, why it worked well. And about 1% of pancreatic cancers have those mutations, G12C. G12D is a predominant mutation in the pancreatic cancer. So there are two possibilities. But having said that, G12C inhibitors did not work well in those cohorts of patients like which had pancreatic cancer, but G12C mutation. So possibly two reasons. If you see the architect of pancreatic as well as the lung cancers, pancreatic cancer has a lot of stroma. So basically there is less seeping of the drug to the site. So that would mean now, if you try to bump up the doses, that can lead to off-target effects. So that's perhaps the reason why these inhibitors uh, did not work well in those cohorts, but it worked very well. I think it was the best out inhibitor for targeting these lung cancers. However, yes. uh, six months into the treatment, patients developed the resistance. As I told you, this G2 mgen sotaricib kind of was fast-tracked uh, by FDA to be used clinically. The reason mm -hmm. was, so what it did, it used this thiol chemistry to bind to the cysteine, which is a G2LC mutant. And then once it bound, it created a pocket which bound to the histidine 95. So what they found, so that's what made it really potent and an eye-catching molecule uh, to outcompete all the uh, competitors because a lot of companies had this G2LC inhibitor. So histidine, touching the histidine 95, which is specific to Keras, made it, you know, uh, it outcompeted basically all the products. Now, six months into the treatment, what they found clinically, I think there was a study from Tankara et al. from Harvard, what they found when they gave this to a patient six months, guess what? The first mutation which came, that histidine changed to isolacy. So the problem is that these cancers are very smart in their own way. So they knew why, what's making them vulnerable, they changed this. Yeah. So the goal, especially for lung cancer or the pancreatic cancer is that you have to use combination therapies. It's a single molecule therapy is not viable. That's why there's a lot of folks on industry to kind of combine this more single agent therapy with immune therapy. The advantage is single agent therapy is quick, but not long lasting. Immune therapy is slow, but long lasting. So if we find a nice blend of the two, that would be the way to treat uh, these cancers. But pancreatic cancer continues to ditch, uh, for, uh, mostly because of a lot of stroma out there. Yeah, and uh, you, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, 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 we had lots of questions. Zahida. Okay, no, I mean to say the, this uh, line of immunotherapy that's what I because can uh, pancreatic cancer is like non curable type. So I yeah. just wanted a small continuation that have you uh, tried uh, Cutridra, the PD1 inhibitor with your uh, M uh, that NS1? No, not, but yeah. We did not, but the, the problem is we are using a different approach. Maybe you will see what's called a HEP immune concept. So what we want is we kind of want to avoid that resistance. So treat with an inhibitor at low doses that just engages the target. And then we, we use our antibody or monobody based biologics to compensate that. So that way we combine immune therapy and we would not post theoretically see resistance because we will be dosing these patients with sub-lethal doses. We just want the target engagement and then our biologic therapy would kick in. So cocktailing the two. Yeah, but no, no we did not try PDM. So no yeah, problem. Thank you. Thank so you. Much.